is up, guys, and welcome to the special Guarani Vision Copa America preview episode for Paraguay's path to the Copa America title as we have Costa Rica now to preview the final episode of our three preview episodes. We already did one with Brazil and Colombia. We were really grateful to do it. And now we have Eddie Mendez, the head of CRC football, a Costa Rican American based in Brooklyn, New York, to talk about Costa Rica's chances against Paraguay and for the overall Copa America happening here in the United States. So, Eddie, I really want to thank you for for doing this. And before we obviously get into our questions and discussion about, in particular, this game and also Costa Rican football, I do have to ask, what is your ties to Costa Rica? What what even inspired you to do the the uh, the CRC football account? And yeah, just tell me, tell us a bit about your story following Costa Rican football. Well, first, guys, thanks for having me. Uh, I always love talking footy. No matter what country we're playing, I always take these opportunities to kind of share as much knowledge as I can. So thank you for having me. Um, obviously, you know, uh, first first generation immigrant. I have parents that were born and raised in Costa Rica. Uh, my father from Morotina and my mother from Upala. Uh, so we have deep roots from Costa Rica. I still have a lot of family members. I don't know how many hundreds of cousins in, in Costa Rica. So it's in my blood. Uh, and of course, if if you're from Costa Rica, you're either a, a manudo for Alajuela or a morado for Saprisa. And while I am a proud Costa Rican, I am a morado. But when it comes to the national team, I'm kind of colorblind, unlike the rest of the country. So uh, those are my ties. The, the CRC football thing actually goes back to my background. I was a senior analyst for Optus Sports when they had offices here in New York City. So I collated data for MLS and Liga MX competitions. And when the offices shut down, I kind of got full time into coaching, but my love for analytics was always there. And I always felt that, you know, Costa Rica was very misrepresented by a lot of the people that I actually worked in those MLS offices with. I uh, didn't really know how to talk about my country, what was going on in my country. So I started the football account and created kind of like my own proprietary rating system. That's kind of what I consider the evolution of the analysis that I did at Optus Sports. And it's kind of been used for scouting purposes, um, you know, helping guys get the platform to move on to the national team or to bigger moves uh, overseas. So it's it's something that I'm very deeply passionate about, something I'm very proud of, of the work uh, that I've put together in the last few years, putting it together. But more than anything, it served as a networking opportunity to to kind of, you know, talk footy with you fine gentlemen. No, well, thank you so much for calling us fine gentlemen, because obviously we probably won't be fine when we do have to face each other in Austin. But no, that that's the thing. Like when me, Fede, Ralph and our, our previous co-host, Maria, was on this, we started this program for four years. You know, we obviously wanted to do something. And, you know, it was obviously for the pandemic when a lot of ideas were going through. We obviously wanted to do something that we felt was was very important to to really talk about Paraguay football, because we also felt a bit misinterpreted interpreted and maybe we wanted to talk about it a bit more and give it that that wider spread especially in 2024 when you know you can connect to anyone to talk about it so no really appreciate you sharing your story and i guess the first thing i do want to ask you here we are we're speaking less than 24 hours before the first copa america game in the united states between argentina and canada i have to ask how are you feeling about costa rica because obviously in this tournament they were a team that were obviously that to qualify it wasn't one of like us of the 10 coma ball teams that were invited uh, obviously, it's also a pathway for you guys to obviously qualify for the World Cup in two years. You have that to go on. And yeah, I just want to ask, like, how are you feeling before this this first tough game group that we have with Brazil and Colombia and obviously with us as well? Yeah, so, you know, the, the Luis Fernando Suarez era and that regime, I consider to be my villain era. Uh, it was one of the darkest moments that I can consider of the last, you know, five years of my fandom, my hatred for the guy was, is well documented. And if you want to just go down that rabbit hole on my Twitter, uh, I, I did not have kind words for him. So kind of watching what he did to my national team and, and what he did to, to football in my country was, you know, was heartbreaking. And I, I couldn't even enjoy the world cup in 2022 because I, I knew what was going to happen in that game against Spain, uh, his willful ignorance to play a four, four, two, and when the 5-4-1 was there, his inability to collect the the right, you know, collection of players, you know, that that was a dark time for us. And, and you know, now we have this this new coach, uh, Gustavo Alfaro, who knows the region well and has really put in the effort to kind of bring in this new generation. And when you look at the average age groups, uh, the average ages of, of all the teams in, in Copa America, we're the youngest, if not one of the top three youngest teams. And 
I think a lot of those talents that 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 I've analyzed in the first division in Costa Rica, this is going to kind of be their platform to not only change the trajectory of our national team, but give them real opportunities to to create generational wealth within their family and secure bigger moves. And, you know, I've always been of the mindset where the groups are tough and that's that's fine, though. I, I like having those big stages because for a country like ours, we don't get a lot of eyeballs on us. You know, if if we're playing lower level competition, nobody's going to really tune in to Costa Rica and a group with like Bolivia. Right. No disrespect to Bolivia. Uh, so having those platforms uh, to play against Brazil, you know, you're going to have eyes on you play Colombia. You know, you're going to have eyes on you. So even though it's a tough group and I know it's a tough ask to get out of it, I think for me, it, it's more about the excitement to see these young kids kind of put on a show and and showcase their abilities and hopefully secure bigger moves overseas. Because I think that for us, it, you know, this is the first step of, of a long two-year project going into World Cup 2026. So I'm excited about the opportunity, even though the group should make me feel very depressed. But like I said, it's just, it's another opportunity for the younger generation. Eddie, that's... Um... That's actually great because that's what I wanted to pick up on. I think it is the youngest average squad in terms of in terms of age. And that made me wonder what exactly is the plan for Alfaro here? So is he looking to just use this to experiment? Are we going to see, for example, maybe three different 11s in the three games? Because ultimately you're looking at the World Cup, which is which I guess the, the key goal for Costa Rica is, is getting back on the world stage. Um or do you think he's trying to build? He's going to build a base, and we're going to see that that same eleven throughout the three the three group games. Yeah, I don't think it'll be the exact eleven, but I think you're going to see that strong core. And he kind of gave us a hint of that in in the World Cup qualifying games because while everybody was playing friendlies, we were starting our our World Cup journey uh, in the Caribbean islands. So even though we were playing what you would consider minnows and Concacaf he kind of put together what I think is going to be the foundation of our competition in, in Copa America. So you'll see probably seven to nine of the same names. And then a few places here and there, mainly in the attack where you'll see some rotation, because I think there's a lot of guys there that are fighting for spots, but in terms of the spine of the team, the back line, um, and, and then even in midfield, I think you can expect to see that, that foundation being laid. And then seeing where those game breakers are going to come in off the bench and, and which players are going to be more rotational than, than solidified starters. The last time Paraguay and Costa Rica faced each other in the Copa America, it was a it was also in the group stage in the US. Uh, it was a nil-nil draw. It wasn't a a great game. Paraguay at the moment has is struggling to score. They they recently scored their, their first goal in a in a long while. Alfaro does have a bit of a reputation of being, he can be defensive minded at times. So what are you thinking of that game? Could we, could we end up seeing another nil nil play out like we did five years ago or no, uh, more than that eight years ago? Yeah. I, I mean, I'll admit I'm, I'm willfully ignorant about anybody kicking a ball outside of Costa Rica. I, I don't even get to enjoy the European stuff with as much of, you know, Asacion Deportivo, Juanica Steca football that I'm watching. You don't really get to enjoy the good stuff. So, not too not too sharp on what's going on in Paraguay, but if you're worried about a defensive setup from Costa Rica, I think that's what you're going to get. Like I said, playing in, in the Caribbean and World Cup qualifying against lower competition, that didn't stop him from going 3-4-3. And my, my thought on that is that he was basically prepping the system and that foundation. So what's eventually going to be a 5-4-1 low block? Understanding what he's going to have to go against in this group, group stage, with even, even up to the Paraguay game. Um, I think the biggest thing that I took away from the qualifiers was at the end of the game against Granada, he moved Calvo from his left center back role into the left wing back role and brought on Juan Pablo Vargas, who plays in Colombia. And I think that to me, when I think of Gerald Taylor on the right side, you're going to look at five, five guys in that back line that have like sort of like a center back player profile type and not real wing backs that you would expect on the outside because I think he's going to be worried about those 1v1 duels. So I, I do expect a defensive setup, and I, I think his main his main goal is to not get embarrassed like Luis Fernando Suarez did against Spain. He wants to avoid that embarrassment for the country. The The moods are, are high, and, you know, we pride ourselves on the art of defending. You know, 2014, that, that's what a lot of that was, was being stubborn in defense, not giving the Dutch, not giving – 
uh, the Greeks not giving Italy, England. We didn't concede that many goals in 2014. And I think we we have no problem priding ourselves on that. And and that that I do expect to happen again in Copa. We are definitely the underdogs in this group, Eduardo, but it's going to be really nice to have that showdown in that third game. And hopefully one of us has the opportunity to keep on going in the competition. Um, obviously, I'm looking uh, forward to this game, especially to seeing these new stars, these new players that you're talking about in this squad. Who Can you can you give us a couple of names of, of players that can really stand out from this squad? Are there any players that you're looking right now that – are, are going to become the stars of, of this team during this, this tournament? Yeah. So I, uh, I guess I'll preview. I'm kind of doing a, a countdown going into our kickoff of like the five players, at least from the domestic league that I'm most excited to see in this tournament. I, I would say my, my top three names domestically, uh, Orlando Gallo, defensive midfielder that plays uh, at Arediano has more of a destroyer. Think of a Casemiro type player profile uh, as a six. I, I think that he, he got suspended for for uh, PEDs, uh, so he was out for a while, but he came back a changed man. Maybe it was the PEDs. I don't know, uh, but it worked because he's he's a completely different player. And, you know, Yeltsin Tejeda was a six for us for a long time. And it, with injuries and age, he kind of – his time is up. Cesar Borges, his time is up. And Orlando Gallo has taken over the heart of that midfield. Uh, so 23 years old, I'm very excited about him. I think the name that – most people in, in the scouting world are excited about is a center back called Jalen Mitchell, uh, who plays for Alapalense, 19 years old, but is literally the prototype of what you want in a big athletic defensive stopper center back. 19 years old, uh, has all the physical skill sets, maybe not the most technical on the ball, but, you know, Kendall Watson had a pretty good career doing that. And I think that this kid's trajectory is is well ahead of where Kendall Watson was uh, in his prime. You know, he's got 10 years uh, on him in, in that regard. So I think for me, those two thinking more defensively are going to have plenty of opportunities to showcase that. And in attack, Andy Rojas, um, he's what well, I would consider he's better as a nine slashing type. Think of a Darwin Nunez type space in behind, but because Ugalde is playing that role and I think he needs to move on from Russia and he, maybe this will be the platform to get an even bigger move like he did from Twente. Um, Andy Rojas, you know, even if he's playing on the wing, lunch pail winger type, I call them. That's his player profile. But 18 years old, very dynamic, uh, strong working skill set, but can create on his own good space in behind. And I think if if our objective is to sit in that low block and punish teams and underloads or or 3v3s in open space, I, I think he's going to have plenty of opportunities to really showcase what he can do. So domestically, those are the three. And then, you know, Manfred Ugalde is, to me, the best player on this team, still young enough and, and hopefully smart enough that this can springboard him out of Russia into an actual top five league. Exciting new names on, on this squad, but there is going to be one big name that's going to be missing that we're accustomed to seeing, which is Kaylor Navas. How is that locker room going to feel that absence? And especially on the pitch, is Costa Rica ready to to have a, a replacement for him? Do they have the replacement? Uh, are you guys safe in that sense? No, I'm still crying. Um, I haven't gotten over it yet. I think you know, most of our strong performances, Kayla Navas had to put on his cape and do his thing. And and he was great for us in that regard. Finding his replacement has been a little frustrating because I, I felt that everybody wanted to give it to Kevin Chamorro, who was the number one for Saprissa. And I'm not the biggest Kevin Chamorro fan. And I think the way that he's kind of tailed off because he was just given the job, I think ultimately cost him because Patrick Saqueda is the one that stepped in in World Cup qualifying. And plays in the third division in Spain, not that big of a a, a league for, for him to play in. But he stepped in, and it looks like that's Alfaro's number one guy, another guy that has the prototype body, has this, the acrobatic skill set. So I think it's going to be his job. But you know he's gonna he's gonna be tested early and often. And if it doesn't go well for him the first two games, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a change in there. But I'm hoping that he's one of the guys that can step up in terms of leadership. Because this is such a young age group, you know, Calvo is maybe the guy that you're going to look to in terms of on the field leadership. But I think actually you're going to see one of these young guys that have that that leadership, that vision, that character skill set. Somebody like in Orlando Gallo that that is going to step in and kind of 
implement himself as the new leader for the new generation. And I think that's fine. You'll have guys like Campbell on the bench that can help out, uh, you know, some of the older guys that can be there off the field. But in terms of on the field leadership to kind of tone things down when they need to, I think you're going to see somebody have to step up and, and start to take that role going into the 2026 World Cup. So obviously it's it's going to be interesting how we go into this final game because, you know, for us, we obviously play Colombia and Brazil first. And if there is a miracle that does indeed come from those two games, we go to the final game in Austin where Paraguay will have to go in for the must win. Or it could be a case of just, you know, Paraguay already knocked out and it comes into a consolation game uh, because obviously all the pressure is going to be on our coach, Danny Garnero, but Moving forward, what do you feel as if though some of the weaknesses that Paraguay can indeed expose against Costa Rica if they were to go into a situation where qualification to the quarterfinals was on the line? I'm going to say whoever they partner with Orlando Gallo in midfield, it'll be a double pivot. And I think one of two things can happen. Either Afado is going to play Brandon Aguilera in that role out of position because he's not a six and to play him as a double pivot in that five, four, one, you're putting him about 70 yards away from the goal that he should be near. So I think defensively, that's somebody that you can also pick on, especially in transition because he's not going to be able to cover the space. Orlando Gallo is going to have to do a lot of the recovery for him. And Orlando Gallo is a destroyer. He can get himself on an early yellow. And I think when you have that kind of partnership, that that worries me. I think the other possibility, if it's not somebody like Aguilera, somebody that I consider to be of a lower caliber player, like a Jefferson Brennis, like an Alejandro Brand, who, you know, they perform well when they're playing Honduras or they're playing Granada or, or St. Kitts. Like, that's fine for that level. But now when you're playing at a much higher level with higher caliber players and you're not playing in the domestic league like you're used to, I think a lot of your flaws are going to start to show. So... I'm really curious how we approach that specific problem because throughout the entire tournament, that's going to be my biggest worry. Uh, I think the other part is just going to be the inexperience. You know, Jalen Mitchell is great. He's athletic, but, you know, a, a backside cross, a blind diagonal, can he misread the, the flight of the ball? Can he be late to the ball? You know, a lot of those little tactical things that are going to be thrown at them at a much faster pace than they're accustomed to. I think how they respond to that because they're so young and a lot of those kids don't have the the reps that they need with this pace, this physicality, if they don't respond well to it, it can kind of snowball out of control from there. So I would say those are the two areas that that were probably the weakest and, and caused me the most concern. So looking ahead to this game and, and more so just kind of your predictions on how do you see this group happening? Do you see Costa Rica causing a surprise like they did back in 2014? Do we see something similar or do you feel like they're going to go into this Copa um, just with experience and to just to build on, like you said, for the for the upcoming World Cup? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to be a homer, but I've always been realistic. I'm too analytical to to think otherwise. I think we get grouped and I think that's fine. Uh, I, I'm more I'm more excited about the potential individual performances. And I think if we can have a handful of those and they they progress into players leaving the domestic league into better leagues. I would consider that to be a success at Copa America. If it's a complete disaster, we lose every game badly and those performances aren't there, then all the, the momentum that you feel that we've been building the, the, you know, the last few months, you kind of have to take a step back and question it like, okay, is the talent really there or we were just, you know, puffing ourselves up for no reason. So that that to me is what I would be most worried about. I'm fine getting grouped. I'm fine losing the games that we lose. But as long as we're competitive, we're not an embarrassment. Uh, the San Marino Twitter account can't make fun of us. Like I, I'm fine with that. Just, just give me that. Give me some good performances. Let us get grouped. But I want to see. I want to see a lot of these kids uh, secure a bigger move. Well, well, hope, um, I'm repeating with you because I don't want to see that San Marino account also make fun of us because we're a team that we don't we don't win a lot of games and we don't score as well. So we've gotten some of that stuff from them as well. So we have to hope that in this Copa we don't get into that. But before we let you go, well, two things actually. The first thing. You're predicting for this game. How do you see it happening? The, here I'll be a homer. Cause okay. I, I feel like I feel like we're gonna leave this Copa with momentum. A very boring one-nothing win where you have to love the art of defending and transition. And it's enough to get the three points. And it probably won't be pretty, but it'll be enough for the three points. 
that's not going to go down well in Paraguay, that's for sure, because this, it is technically the weakest team of the three. And as much as we've been kind of a defensive and boring side, we still need to win teams. We still need to beat teams that are of that caliber. So, yeah, no, I, I you know, Eddie, I really want to thank you for, for doing this. I'm obviously expectant, like me and Fede, myself, and, and Ralph are obviously expectant of Costa Rica in this Copa America. It's going to be interesting to also see some of those players that you'd mentioned in World Cup qualification. We're obviously going to keep an eye on that to see who will go to the tournament in Mexico, Canada, and the United States. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for doing this. But before we let you go, last thing, where can everyone find your work? And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Again, thanks for having me. Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, uh, at CRC Football, uh, F-U-T-B-O-L. Uh, and same on Instagram. Instagram is sort of like the visual representation of my, my analytic work just to make it prettier uh, because my words, they get pretty mundane and boring after a while. <laughs> No, I get it. I understand. So, uh, no, thank you again, Eddie, for doing this. And thank you, obviously, to my two co-hosts, Fede and Ralph, for helping me out on this special Copa America preview episode on Guadani Vision, speaking about the Costa Rican national team as we head and prepare for the game against Paraguay in Austin. So, for myself, Roberto Rojas, Fede Perez, and Ralph Hanna, thank you so much for listening in. See you soon.